Okay. Great. Uh, so I'm very excited to have uh, Juan here today to tell us about electroweak skirmions uh, in the Higgs effect of field theory, uh, a topic that it seems like we'll have uh, a bit of something for everyone. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to, to hear what he has to tell us. Uh, take it away whenever you're ready, Juan. Okay, thank you. So yeah, so the talk is, is indeed about uh, skirmions in the, in the electroweak theory. And uh, it is based on these uh, two papers I have with uh, Michael Spanowski and Valia Jose from Durham. Um, and mostly on the second one, in which we use the, um, the framework of the Higgs effective field theory, this heft, uh, in order to describe these, these solutions. And um, indeed, so in fact, in both papers, um, we use some numerical method, which is based on ma machine learning methods. And I think this is very interesting and I, can be applied to many non-perturbative problems. So I will talk a little bit about this uh, later in the, in the talk. Uh, but first, um, a brief introduction to what skirmions are. So um, they're a kind of uh, topological soliton that appears in some uh, EFTs. Uh, usually, in the, so in the context of uh, high energy physics, these are EFTs um, for some broken symmetry some, roughly speaking, some SU2 symmetry that's uh, broken. Um, originally, uh, they were found in um, an effective field theory for pions. Uh, so as you know, the pions can be viewed as um, uh, pseudo Gaussian bosons. You can collect them into this matrix U, which is their exponential. Uh, and then you construct your effective Lagrangian, then the chiral Lagrangian as a function of this uh, U. And uh, what people found back then in the 80s, um, or maybe even uh, before, it's uh, that um, in this theory, you have some non-trivial um, solutions which are topologically protected and they share many properties with variants. So we're, people were very excited about this because you can have, so you, you just have the pion fields and you get the variants for free in this theory, in, in a sense. Um, and then, uh, you might notice that this theory is similar in some sense to the electroweak theory. Uh, and this is because again, in the, in the electroweak sector, we have a collection of three Goldstone bosons, um, which are to be eaten by the W and the Z. So these are the longitudinal, longitudinal components of uh, the massive uh, vector bosons. Um, and yeah, and the theory takes this form for, for these uh, Goldstones. So uh, a natural question is whether there are skirmions uh, here too. But the answer is not straightforward because we have many more degrees of freedom now. We have the Higgs and we have uh, the rest of the components of the, Boston, uh, of the um, uh, gauge bosons. Um, so yeah, so um, in order to, to describe the electroic theory, um, um, a, a version of the electroweak theory which can contain skirmions, we need a kind of effective field theory. We need higher uh, dimensional operators. Uh, and for this, uh, we use the, this Higgs effective field theory. So I'll explain what this is, and then we will see how skirmions arise uh, here. So since before, before this discovery of the Higgs, uh, there have been two main frameworks for um, describing physics beyond the standard model using only the, the standard model degrees of freedom. So only adding higher dimensional operators to, to the standard model. And these are the Higgs effective field theory, the heft, and the standard model effective field theory, the SMEFT. Um, and the, different be the difference between the two is in um, how the electronic symmetry is uh, realized, either nonlinearly or uh, linearly. So this means that um, in the heft, we have two different fields, uh, the Higgs, uh, which is, uh, which, uh, is invariant under the electroweak uh, gauge group, and the set of Goldstone bosons. And this can appear independently in the Lagrangian. Well, in the SMEFT, these two fields are collected into a single uh, one, a, a doublet, just as in the standard model. And it can only appear in, in, inside the Lagrangian in, in this combination. So in particular, this means that there's a special point um, um, here in the scalar sector. If the Higgs, um, if the H field goes to minus V, this uh, phi is zero, 
and uh, we don't have any, so the ghost on boson matrix is not even well defined here. So basically all, all that freedom collapses to, to a point uh, at, that, um, at that point in, in H space. So uh, we can describe this in terms of what's the topology of the scalar manifold. Um, so in the heft, we have a, a three-dimensional sphere, a parameter, so which is parameterized by the ghost and bosons. And then we have independently a, a set of real values for the Higgs. Well, in the SMEFT, we have a, a four-dimensional space, which is equivalent to, to, to two-dimensional space for over the complex numbers. And this is how we usually view the, the Higgs tablet, right? So the topology of these two things are, is uh, very different. Even if the SMEFT seems as a particular case of the heft, in this particular case, we get a different topology for, for the scalars. And finally, uh, another difference between the two is that in the SMEFT, you, in principle, you are allowed to have um, any cut of scale, which uh, comes from the um, coefficients of higher dimensional operators uh, that you have there. Uh, while in the heft, um, perturbative unitarity will be broken at some scale, which is related to the weak scale V. So um, roughly around 4 pi V, maybe a bit higher, you will have violation of perturbativity. And so the, the cutoff of the theory should be there. So there are some new degrees of freedom there probably. But uh, yeah, the most important thing from, from this slide is the, the difference in the topology between the two. So you see the, the heft has a non-trivial topology and this will help um, having um, top, uh, solutions that are at least partially topologically protected. Um, and the fields, the relevant fields uh, uh, here for the electronic sector in the heft are uh, the, the Higgs, uh, the set of ghost and bosons, which always appear inside this matrix U, and the, the gauge bosons. Uh, I'm taking, so I'm neglecting here the U1 part of the electroweak symmetry, so I only have uh, the, the gauge bosons for, for this U2. So this is like uh, taking G prime equals zero. Um, and then the power counting is uh, also unconventional. Instead of just counting the canonical dimension of each operator and suppressing by the corresponding power of the cutoff scale lambda, seen in the standard model EFT, um, here you have a counting in terms of chiral dimension. So basically derivatives and gauge fields count as having chiral dimension one, and the Higgs and the Boston uh, have chiral dimension zero. Uh, and you suppress operators by some power of the cutoff scale, which is uniquely determined by the, the chiral dimension. Um, and so uh, because of this, you can write the Lagrangian in this form. So as a sum of operators, which split into, the, into two parts. This Q uh, part is um, some product of Goldstones, gauge bosons, and, and derivative of, of the Higgs. And then you factor out um, this part, which um, is the, the dependence on the Higgs field. Um, and yeah, and this F of, of H is, is this factor and it should be a, a polynomial or a, a power series in H over V. So this is the definition of the heft. And um, you work with this by um, imposing, so deciding uh, what's the maximum chiral dimension you're going to look at. We um, look here uh, at operators with chiral dimension up to four, and you write down all the operators uh, um, consistent with the symmetry and having this chiral dimension uh, at most. Uh, and this is the, the list that we get. Um, so we, uh, yeah, I have written here all the operators with chiral dimension less than or equal to four. And um, some operators with chiral dimension four will be needed um, for, for screamers to, to exist. Um, maybe I should say, so here the, this L is um, some combination of derivatives and, and goldstones and the brackets uh, in, the, uh, in the operators, they denote the trace of uh, whatever is inside. So this is up to Kyle dimension four and the standard model um, is given just by the Kyle dimension two operators. So uh, there's the constant operator, which you can multiply by some function of H, and this is the Higgs potential. Then you have the Higgs kinetic term, which is multiplied by, by a constant one half. Uh, and for example, this 
kinetic term for the Wollstones. It is multiplied by some function of B, so it includes the kinetic term and also interactions with the, with the Higgs. And this gives the, the full uh, sector of the, of the standard model uh, that we would be interested in. Um, but in order to have skirmiers, um, we need some kind of embedding of the original square model into this heft. Um, and to do, to do this, uh, we can just pick, so the standard model plus one extra term, known as the skirm term, which uh, takes this form. So we can write it in, in terms of two of these uh, Carroll dimension four operators that I have shown, QD1 and QD2. Um, Okay, so this is an embedding of the original uh, square uh, model into this uh, theory with multiple user theory. Um, and so people have already considered electroweak skirmings before, but in some kind of approximation, basically taking some limit that simplifies uh, the setting. So one of these limits is the frozen Higgs uh, limit. This is taking the Higgs uh, mass to be very large of freezing the Higgs value to its uh, bed. Um, and then you, so you have the, the gauge bosons and the goldstones, and you find skirmium solutions, but they are only metastable. They can decay into the vacuum. And um, this happens only for some values of the, of the coefficient of the skirmium term. And this was done, so this was very computed in the, in the 80s. Um, then there's this other limit, which I'm going to limit P, which is decoupling the gauge field. Um, so in this case, you keep uh, a dynamical Higgs boson and the constant bosons, but uh, you remove the gauge fields. Um, and here you actually have a topological protection, so the skirmions exist and they cannot decay into, into the vacuum. And this is, of course, un uh, unless the electronic symmetry is linearly realized. So crucially, this depends on this heft topology that uh, I have mentioned before. So, so you have some non-trivial manifold scalar sector. Uh, yeah, and this has been considered relatively recently. Uh, and finally, you can take both limits. So remove the gauge fields and, um, and the Higgs. And this is the case, uh, exactly the same as in QCD for the bions. And this was, uh, yeah, in the 80s, you already have like this limit. So our aim here is to be able to work with the full theory without taking any of these limits and see if the um, uh, skirmish solutions still survive uh, here. So, okay, so let's see um, how they look like and how these skirmions um, appear in the heft. For this, we need uh, to define a couple of topological charges. Um, so first, uh, this is in the scalar sector. In order for um, um, a solution, a static uh, field configuration to have finite energy, it, it must uh, go to a pure gauge at uh, spatial infinity. And it, this means that we can partially fix uh, the gauge by taking the fields to go to a constant, basically. Uh, and since the fields go to a constant in any direction uh, as you go to spatial infinity, uh, you can. Um, basically add the point at infinity to, to the dimensional space and you get a three-dimensional sphere. So you can view this uh, matrix U uh, as having um, a domain which is uh, a three-dimensional sphere and its, um, its target space is also an S3. So it's a function from S3 to S3. And these functions can be classified by a winding number. Um, which doesn't change um, under continuous deformations of you. So this is computed, for example, using this integral. This is an integer. And as long as the time evolution of you is continuous, this can never change. So this is for the scalar sector. And then we have the gauge sector. And here we can define the turn uh, Simon's number, which is again, uh, 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 some integral of the fields. And this is not, um, uh, an integer, this is a real number, so it's a continuous quantity. But um, when um, W is a pure gauge, so it takes this form, then it becomes an integer and it, it coincides with the winding number of the gauge transformation that um, gives you W. Um, 
So yeah, so we have these two um, topological charges so to, to um, classify our solutions. And it turns out that both of them are not gauge invariant. So uh, they transform under large gauge uh, transformations uh, by um, um, some um, shift by an integer. And it is the same integer for, for both. So you can take the difference between the two and you get the Spermian number, which is a gauge invariant quantity. So in some sense, the Spermian number is a difference in winding between the scalar sector and the gauge sector. It, uh, a Spermian is uh, something that winds differently in, in both. Um, okay, so um, now for the actual um, solutions, um, we have to so, fix some of the freedom that we have with, with all these fields. So first uh, we pick the unitary gauge. Um, so this U matrix is uh, the constant identity matrix. This means that the winding number in the, in the scalar sector will be zero. And then all of the winding will be um, done in the, in the gauge um, field. Um, and uh, and uh, then we pick a spherically symmetric uh, configuration for the field. So the, the Higgs is parameterized in this way in terms of a real function of, of one real variable which is uh, the, the distance from the origin and the um, and, uh, gauge bosons they are parameterized in terms of these three uh, real functions of uh, a real variable. Uh, so this is what's called the spherical uh, ansatz. And uh, what it does is basically that if you do uh, some rotation in space, it translates into a custodial transformation of, of a, a W. So, okay, so now, um, we are, we are going to look at, for a solution, which will be some configuration for these four functions, eta, f1, f2, um, and b. Uh, and in, um, well, we define this simplified version of the winding number, which takes a very simple form in terms of uh, these functions. And it basically coincides with the Skirmian number at integer values. It will interpolate differently between between integer values, but in the end, if you want to go, for, for example, from schema number zero to schema number one, which we will do, and then this uh, will give you the same path in the end. And so yeah, so we have these four uh, functions, and um, this is the the machine. Sorry, uh, sorry John, you yeah. can you can you go back to the previous like two slides of before? So basically, you are setting as such in a, in a in a way that uh, you rotate away any possible winding in the U field, and you dumped everything into the W field. Exactly. And then you're just computing that Chan Chan Simons number from that, right? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Good. Another yes. another thing that I was a little bit confused about uh, in I guess it was one one slide earlier than this. Um. So good. So yeah. So the definition of Chan Sin as uh, a Skirmian number. In fact, in fact, that there can be two different versions. One, uh, for example, some somebody will take only the NU, which happen to be actually gauge invariant but not conserved. But then the version that you showed here is actually conserved, yeah, but not gauge invariant in a sense that NU is gauge invariant but not NCS. Um, um, okay. Yeah, so there's, you're saying there's a version of NU that's so not conserved, but it is gauge invariant. Right, so from one formulation, okay. the addition of uh, NCS can be viewed as a contribution from the local counter term. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so if you have a, some anomaly, uh, you can always add some local counter term to change the, uh, or more precisely shift around the anomalies. So, mm -hmm. While I understand when you say gauge invariance, because uh, if you shift two things together simultaneously, of course, this will not change. And yeah. SK will not change according to your definition. Yeah. But even for the uh, small local gauge transformation, I think NCS is not gauge invariant. Um, uh, but I believe NU is um, gauge invariant. But I, I, I don't think we need to delve into this too much. But anyway, I just want okay, to- Okay, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually not sure at, uh, about NCS. So we, have, we also have some boundary conditions over the gauge fields, which I'm not mm -hmm. showing. This may uh, fix um, some of that gauge freedom. 
Okay, we can. Um, I think we can talk more about uh, la later after you. Your... Yeah, yeah. Let's. Okay. okay. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. So why why would uh, but but simply why would NU or NCS change under small gauge transformations? It should not, right? Uh, no. So NCS will uh, because uh, NCS is basically three transcyme section, and then uh, right. if there is a boundary, of course, it's not gauge invariant, as we know. Uh, and NU is actually transcyme, 3D transcyme section, uh, but with the gauge transformation by U. And of course, at the end of the day, you set the gauge field to be uh, zero. And that particular combination under the gauge transformation uh, transforms like uh, transforming under uh, unbroken subgroup. And it, 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 it is known that it is, in, it is invariant. But okay, so I think there's some technical details. That, uh, um, about the, the transform of number, um, so if if we are in the three sphere instead of in R3, is it also um, not gauge invariant? I actually don't know much about this. <laughs> yeah, so, so yeah, I think uh, we, we can chat more about this. Okay, after. yeah. Let's you say yeah, that uh, NCS can acquire non integer values, that is what you're. So it, it not only can take non integral value, but it actually is not a gauge invariant, even under the small gauge transformation. Okay, that confuses me, but okay, let's continue. Yes, okay, I'm happy to bring it later. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so let's um, continue from here then. So yeah, I was saying, uh, I was getting to the numerical um, method here. So it, what we did what we did is we parameterized these four functions as a neural net. Um, so this is um, some nonlinear function that takes one input and it has four outputs. Um, and um, what it does is um, at its step here um, it does an affine transformation and then it has some uh, activation function which uh, should be nonlinear. Yeah, we used a sigmoid and you apply this to, to each of the outputs of each um, step. So um, this is actually the, the architecture that, that we use. You can see it's a very small net. So we have an affine transformation from one input into four outputs, it's followed by a sigmoid, then a, an affine transformation from five inputs to five outputs, followed by a sigmoid, and finally one affine transformation from five to four. Um, and then we have many free parameters inside this, in all these uh, transformations. And uh, the idea is that we can fit this uh, so that mm, this net solves uh, the problem that uh, we have. Um, and um, okay, let me go back to, to, to that in, in a second. But so you do this by uh, mm, minimizing some uh, lo loss function. So you have a uh, something that's a function of the net um, and uh, you usually you use some framework which there are many or, uh, there and they, they work uh, very well. Um, and you do some kind of gradient descent and you go to the minimum of, of your loss function. And if yeah, you have picked uh, your loss function correctly, uh, the minimum of the loss function will give the solution to your problem. So Usually, um, um, you can use um, this kind of formulation to, to solve the differential equations that you would get. So in this case, uh, the equations of motion for, for, a discriminant, uh, for getting a discriminant solution. But here we try to do something even simpler, which doesn't even require to, to get the equations of motion, which is just putting us the, so having as the loss function uh, directly the energy. And since what we want to find is a minimum of the energy, um, this uh, yeah this procedure should should uh, be to, to us. This is not all. So we add uh, we need more terms because we need to fix uh, boundary conditions, and we would also like to control um, uh, the value of this winding number um, and fix it to to whatever to whatever value we want. So we have these terms which are multiplied by some high weight in omega uh, dc and omega n. 
Um, and if you make these two weights large enough, uh, you will basically have that minimizing the, the loss function amounts to minimizing the energy while satisfying this condition, or making these two things uh, zero. Um, so yeah, so uh, the slide I had before was just to show that, um, so these are the, the, action, the, the, the equations of motion for, for uh, this theory, and as you can see, they are quite complicated. There's, there's second order equations in, in the one and two, but we um, have here uh, many um, terms. Um, and not only this, but you need to fix uh, the boundary conditions. Uh, so this is not an initial value problem. So uh, you need to, to have some method for, for finding the solution for these boundary conditions, so maybe starting with different initial conditions and shooting and seeing if, if it goes to the right value. And then if you like, if you would like uh, to fix the value of the winding number, you would also need to introduce Lagrange multipliers, which complicates it um, a bit more. So while this is doable, it takes a lot of um, um, effort and, and uh, tuning on, on these things and being able to solve these equations. And uh, with this method, you, you so we computed them for, for uh, doing a cross check, but you can even not compute equations of motion, so no Euler, Euler Lagrange equations. You just plug the, your, the functional that you have and you get a minimum automatically from, from your neural net uh, framework. So I think this is very nice and can be applied to for many other problems. Um, and this is the, so this is one of the solutions that we get. So this is for uh, just the standard model plus uh, the squirm term. So this is the minimal thing that uh, you could have. Um, and this is fixing the num donor number two value. And we get here, here as the outputs of the net. Uh, this for functions. So the, the three functions for gauge fields, which are F1, F2, and B, and then eta, which is the, the Higgs. And we can vary uh, NW and get different uh, solutions for, for it. Um, and this indeed allows us to get these plots, which are um, plots for the energy as a function of the winding number. So we can see actually how uh, the minimal energy path looks like when going from the vacuum to the square mirror, for example. Um, so, well, so the plot in the, in the right is uh, the energy in physical units and, and in the left it is um, multiplied by some um, function of the, of the coefficient of the square mirror operator. So this is normalized to kind of natural units for, for square mirrors. And um, I have different lines here because I'm changing the value of the uh, coefficient of the square term. So this small e parameter, it controls uh, the size of this coefficient. And as you can see, there's a, so for sufficiently high values of e, there's a local minimum close to winding number equals one uh, and some finite energy barriers separating it from the vacuum. Um, as you go to lower values of E, you get to a point where this barrier disappears, basically. And so there are no square mirrors below this critical value of E of about 0 0.9. Um, and okay, then the so, reason for the, yeah? Sorry, one quick question. So, so this bound, in a sense, is from the combination of both the gauge field as well as radial mode, right? For the, from the combination of sorry. So so this this bound is uh, in, uh is in the presence of both gauge field and uh, radial mode of the Higgs. Yes yes yes. Oh, and everything. then how does this bound compare to say Rubakov et al. bound that where they only consider the gauge boson? Uh, I actually as I should know this but I don't remember. I I I think it's close. So it, it will be close. But oh, it is in the yeah. same ballpark. Say. I, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the, the just curious. It's is a bit lower. I'm sorry, can you say that again? I didn't catch. The energy of the screen is a bit lower than lambda. I see. So it makes sense uh, because you have the heat. So you have to have heat. Okay. Um, has anyone tried to come up with a, some sort of a simple, uh, simple argument, either based on dimension analysis and same topology? to come up with a slightly more analytic 
estimation of this bound or it has or been based on just numerical calculation? Oh, I can hear your voice. Is it my problem or everyone's problem? I don't know. If someone else can hear me? No, I think I can hear you now. Yeah, I can. I think it was my problem. Okay, good. Uh, so all all that I know is uh, numerical calculations. I don't know of any analytical ones. I see. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Mm. And one um, uh, more basic question, I think I, I probably just missed this earlier on. Um, in the standard model itself, is the coefficient of this zero? Yes. So, yeah. So I can, mm. yeah, I can explain this over these plots, in fact. So in that case, um, if you look on the right plot, which is in physical units, um, you can see that as E goes um, higher, uh, the, the height of this minimum here, it goes lower, right? So the blue line is the highest value mm. of E. And um, I don't have this here, but E, was, so the coefficient was one over E. So going to E equals infinity means going to uh, the standard model. I see. So yeah, this thank brings, you. This brings the square mean down to en zero energy. And then it be this becomes like um, a transition from one vacuum to another, basically. And the, the top of the barrier here is like the sphalerin. Thank you. Um, so uh, yeah. So, the reason why I have the, the two plots is uh, so first in the in the first one in these natural units um, you can see that the the local minimum is uh, at a constant height basically when when for the values for which it exists it it stays approximately at, at a at a constant value and this so this is small e times the energy um, this is the mass of the skirmium. So the mass of the skirmion should be some constant over E. So we get this relation uh, that the, the mass of the skirmion is proportional to, to one over E. And on the right plot, um, you see that the, the height of the barrier, it is about 10 TeV, which also makes sense because it's uh, close to the, to, the, to the value of the, of the sphaleron barrier uh, for the standard model. And if you, and as you increase the, um, um, so as you change E and you get to this uh, extreme case, which is the red line, which the, the, the local minimum is almost disappearing, uh, then it goes to about 10 TeV. So it's in this range, uh, uh, sorry, 11 TeV. So it's in this range of uh, between 10 TeV and 11 TeV. So we can view it also in this way. So the, the, the barrier, stays constant and the mass of the skirmion changes and whenever it goes above the barrier, yeah, the skirmion disappears. Um, okay, so I think that's all for, for these plots. And um, once we have the solutions, of course, we have the, the full configuration so we can compute anything, uh, any of the properties. And for example, um, uh, we can compute the, the, the radius of the skirmion using this formula and we get something that also scales as one over E. So it's proportional to the, to the skirmion mass. So, okay, so, so far uh, what I've been saying, it works for the skirm term. So this is a particular operator in the, in the heft, uh, but the approach of effective field theory is writing down every possible operator and seeing what the effects of all of them are. Uh, and this is what we did. That, that's why uh, we had that table with all the operators. So I have copied it here again, but I have written in the third column the contribution of that operator to the energy um, in the, uh, to the energy density in the spherical ansatz. So you can see what the contribution uh, e, uh, looks like. And um, so the first question about all these operators is whether any one of them just by themselves can stabilize the, the, the skirmion. Uh, we know that the skirm term does, as I have shown, but there might be others. 
Uh, so first of all, the, the standard model operators, they cannot do this. Um, we know this, uh, well, we, we know this because it, it already happened in the, in the, in the square model and um, adding gates fields doesn't give us any advantage because this configuration is close to uh, Charles Simon's number equals one. This means that it's close to a pure gauge configuration. And so this gauge field strengths, um, they will be close to zero and any perturbation will bring this operator to zero. And then we're back to the, to the original scrum term. And this is actually an argument from the theorem, which tells us that solitons cannot exist in this theory. Um, then these other operators, pretty much by the same argument, they also cannot uh, establish kernels because they contain uh, gauge field strengths. This will go to zero in a pure gate, and then uh, you are back to, to the standard model. So we're left with these five operators. They all um, uh, consist of uh, four derivatives of uh, the Higgs and the Goldstones. Um, and by picking each one of them individually and uh, adding it to the standard model, we checked uh, numerically whether we could find uh, skirmions and uh, we saw that the last three, they, they cannot um, give skirmions either. Um, and intuitively for me, so if you look at the um, contribution to the, to the energy density uh, in the spherical ansatz, you can see that there's a neta prime uh, multiplying each of them. This is the, the derivative of the Higgs field. So if you, if you could, if uh, your configuration can go to uh, to um, uh, to one in which the Higgs field is constant, then all these operators are zero, and you're back to to the standard model. So intuitively, I think it makes also sense that uh, this uh, don't work. So we're back to the two operators that were already in the square model, but um, we don't need to have them in the same combination as they uh, were in the in the original uh, theory. So uh, we have we can parameterize them in terms of two different Wilson coefficients. Uh, let's say for simplicity, C1 and C2. Um, the original scrum term is C1 equals minus C2. Uh, and now we take this parameterization, which so it's like polar coordinates, right? Uh, the, this E parameter uh, gives us the radius and then we have an, a theta angle. Um, and then we, did a kind of grid search in this space, and we found some limiting values of this angle theta for skirmings to exist. So the, the, between 0 0.7 and 1.6 pi. And in this range, now we look for values of E that support uh, skirmings, and we found we find that there are critical values of each of E for each value of theta, and it varies like this. Um, we can also view this in, in the space of C1 and C2 coefficients. Um, and so the two lines here that come from the origin, they are the two limiting values of the angle of theta. And um, uh, the color coding gives us the, um, uh, the mass of the skirmion. So you see as we go away from the origin, the skirmion ma mass increases. And this critical value of phi, which varied for different values of theta, it turns out to uh, just give an upper bound over the, man, over, over the mass of the skirmium for any value of theta that is uh, 11 TeV. So the picture is simplifies a bit in this, in this sense. So we can get this uh, simple expression for the mass as a function of uh, C, C1 and C2. Um, what is the lower bound that you find? Is there a lower bound or, or can be a the, small? I'm just uh, about to, when, yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk about that right now. So this is an upper bound of 11 TeV. Uh, and then, um, so we would like, so this, in order to, to be able to, to work with these skirmions, uh, they, they have to have some classical behavior, right? So uh, uh, the radius should be, this is a rough bound, but the radius should be larger than the Compton uh, wavelength. The radius, as I said, is proportional to the mass and the Compton wavelength is inversely proportional to the, to the mass. So this already gives a lower bound on, on the mass of the skirmions and it is about um, one TeV. So, so far from what we've seen, it's 
the mass of the square mirror must be between one TeV and 10 TeV. But then there are more limits. Um, so, okay, I will talk about those limits in a, in a moment, but just a final comment on, on, the, oper on the set of operators that we have. So, and so we, we already know that all the other operators, they, not, they do not support the square mirrors by themselves, but maybe if we add them uh, to 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 other operator to C uh, to QD one and QD two, uh, they could give significant uh, contributions to to the skirmium and ch change uh, its shape or uh, its mass or its mass. But um, well, we found that this isn't the case. So uh, what um, or it doesn't seem to be the case. So this is um, this is a plot of the contribution to the energy density as a function of the radius for each of the operators that um, we included in the original um, analysis of Skirmus. So this four standard model operators and QD1 and QD2. And you can see that they have values that range between 0.1 and um, about uh, two. Um, and now what we did is for the configuration that we obtained uh, with these operators, we compute what the energy would be uh, if we added uh, uh, the other operators and we get this very, very low values of uh, the uh, contribution to the energy. So this, uh, this shows that um, these operators don't, will not um, change the energy by much and it doesn't seem like they would change also the, the shape of, of the skirmion by, by much. Um, of course, uh, so the, the full analysis would be to include them in the in the skirmion calculation and, and, and computing the solution with them included instead of just computing the contribution after we have computed the, the configuration. But um, I think this is already enough indication that they are not very important for, for skirmions. Um, and now, so about the phenomenology of skirmions, how can we uh, learn more things about them um, experimentally? Uh, well, first, um, um, the process of producing a skirmion or a skirmion decaying is very similar to an instant, right? It is a transition that goes from the vacuum over some finite energy, energy barrier, which indeed is about 10 TeV, so similar to, to sphalerum, and then going down to some uh, local minimum instead of um, a vacuum in the case of the instant. Um, and this kind of thing is known to be hard to see at colliders. This process is being suppressed. So um, our guess is that skirmings will also be very hard to, to produce at colliders. Uh, however, with uh, this analysis, we now know which operators can um, generate skirmings and we can look for uh, other effects of these operators. And in this way, we can indirectly uh, uh, learn something about skirmions uh, through searches at uh, colliders. Um, and the, the, the relevant searches here are searches for anomalous quartic glitch couplings because these operators contain four covariant derivatives. Uh, so they, yeah, so they produce some um, changes in the, quant in the quartic glitch couplings. So, um, this plot summarizes all, all the limits. Um, so this is a zoom in version of the, of the plot I have shown before for the coefficient C1 and C2. And the dashed lines are the limits from LHC that I was talking about. So these are experimental searches for uh, anomalous gauge, um, uh, quartic gauge couplings. So we must be inside this uh, red uh, rectangle. Uh, then the um, the color gradient region, uh, it is um, the same as before. It is the, the points for which we find uh, a skirmion solution. And the solid um, orange line here, um, it is the, the limit from classicality. So this rough limit, maybe it, it could move a little bit, but it is this rough limit for skirmions to behave classically. Um, and finally, the, the blue region is uh, uh, from positivity bounds. So as you may know, um, you can obtain some bounds on the coefficients of EFT by requiring general things such as unitarity, causality, etc. This is more or less the same as requiring that the EFT has a, a UV completion. 
and you can see it rules out a, a, a big region of the parameter space. So we are left with this small region in which um, um, we have allowed values of the coefficients that can uh, generate um, skirmions and this pinpoints the, the, what the mass sh should be uh, for skirmions really well. So it should be between one and two TeV basically um, from all this, from this collection of all these limits. And finally, as just the final point um, uh, about uh, uh, phenomenology and with this I, I will conclude. Um, just as I said that skirmion production is difficult to, to have, the same goes for skirmion decay. So you could expect that skirmions um, are um, very long lived and they could um, be viable dark matter candidates. Um, so we did this very naive calculation just to get an idea of the order of magnitude of things that uh, you would need for, in order for this to work. So uh, assuming that uh, the skirmion uh, relic density is produced through a freeze out mechanism uh, and taking the annihilation cross section for skirmions to just be the skirmion area. So pi times radius of the skirmion squared uh, and fixing the, so fixing the, the abundance to the right abundance to, to form all of the dark matter, we get this mass for skirmions that's about 60 GeV. And this is very, very uh, well below the, the, the lower limit that we have, that we had uh, of about one TeV from classical uh, behavior. So this doesn't seem like um, a viable possibility. However, there are many things that we are not taking into account here. So I think more detailed calculations are really needed. Um, first of all, finite temperature effects, which could change the shape of the potential by a lot, maybe the height of the barrier and the mass of the scormium. And uh, then the, the cross section should probably be computed in, 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 in some other way, maybe through simulations of collisions of scormiums. Uh, but yeah, and there are many things that could alter this, this picture. And I think it's a very interesting possibility that you could have dark matter candidates with, having only the, the standard model degrees of freedom in your, in your field theory. Um, um, sorry, here, okay. okay. Uh, sorry, let me just ask. So here, um, by annihilation, uh, do you have in mind skirmy, anti-skirmy annihilation to the standard model yeah. stuff? So it doesn't yeah. need to go through the this instant tone effect. And that's why you kind of assume that the analysis cross-section is geometric. Otherwise, yes. it can be much more surprised than I... Yeah, I guess, uh, yeah. Okay. I guess so, exactly, yeah. Okay. Um, oh, you can't... Maybe you can see this. Okay, I can't. So, um, so yeah, to conclude, just a summary of some points that I have said. So, the numerical, just about the numerical method, um, we have these neural nets that can help solving variational problems directly instead of computing equations of motion, etc. You can solve constrained variational problems pretty easily. And we have this code uh, called uh, ELBET, which uh, solves um, both differential equations and uh, variational problems with very generic boundary conditions using neural nets. Um, and then about skirmions. Um, so we have seen that they exist uh, in the electronic sector, uh, even when you have uh, a dynamical Higgs and um, um, vector bosons. Um, uh, and it exists uh, only for some values of the, of the Wilson coefficients in the heft. Um, and uh, if these values are, uh, so if all constraints on these Wilson coefficients are taken into account, the mass of the skirmium must be around uh, one, one, two TeV. Um, and yeah, and finally, there's a possibility that skirmions being long-lived could, be, could form more of the dark matter and you could have this um, only with standard model degrees of freedom, but more detailed calculations are needed in order to, to understand this better. Um, and that would be all. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Juan. Um, I, I, I'm worried I can't turn on my video uh, uh, to, to let you see me clapping because uh, my internet isn't very good. But that um, okay. is really interesting. I, I would not have guessed that, that we had such good constraints on um, how the scrimmians could appear. Um, let, me, let, let, let me take the privilege of asking the first question. Um, is this is very naive, but is there the possibility that that even higher dimensional operators could be um, could do anything, or or is that they're just definitely irrelevant? I'm not sure. I I guess they could. In, in principle, I I don't see why. So so the 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 argument why you need this. Uh, dimension four operators is a uh, direct argument, which says that, well, basically analyzing the, the dimension of operators, it turns out that if you don't have this, uh, your configurations rapidly shrink and, and um, they decrease energy as they shrink. So all your possible solitons, they disappear. Um, but having higher dimension than, than this is also good for, for Derek's uh, theorem. So in that sense, it could work. Mm. And then, uh, yeah, Interesting. I don't know. yeah. Hmm. It might be that so. Yeah, these operators are also more suppressed too, so that could be also an effect. Yeah. Right. Interesting. Um, does anyone else have uh, any other questions before I continue <laughs> asking questions? Um, I have questions, but I, I'm happy to wait if someone else has questions. All right, well, let me ask a, a short, uh, uh, somewhat general question. Um, can you say something about how generic the skirm terms are in UV completions? Is it like anything will produce these or do um, you have to have um, special, yeah. Yeah, no, no, they, they appear in many. So yeah. Uh, we have looked at a couple of examples and they appear in, so for example, a scalar singlet, I think already gives you this. And um, a scale, uh, I think a vector singlet probably too. So the scalar singlet, I don't think it gives you the skirm term exactly. It gives you some other combination of these two operators, but there's mm. some vector triplet or singlet which gives you exactly the, the skirm term. So it's, it seems pretty generic. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. All right, let me let uh, Sung Wu have a turn. <laughs> uh, oh, great. Uh, so my question, I have two questions, at least for now. So uh, when you plot this uh, energy versus uh, winding number thing uh, in the, uh, at, the, at the beginning of, uh, more or less beginning of the, yes, good, here. So I guess uh, the, the reason why you don't get the minima exactly at NW equal to one is the artifact of the fact that the Lagrange multiplier for winding number is not large enough to enforce exact integer winding number, right? I mean, just topologically, we know that uh, it is unlikely that we have uh, some non-integer value. Uh, mm. I'm not sure. So I, I, I think the, the, the Lagrange multiplier is is enough to so that we fix it to to a value that it should be less than one percent away or maybe one per mil. Oh, so, so basically, it, then you have searched the winding number which is not integer as well. When you when you of course yeah. uh, get these data points, so yeah. then uh, in physics wise, um, I would have thought that the S Fermi is actually integral quantized, like zero, one, two, three, right? So. Uh, even even if we include the W and radial Higgs effect, even though they mm -hmm. can modify the stability property, but I wonder if it will modify the topological charge structure itself. Mm. I don't see why it should be exactly at one. Well, um, uh, can... well, yeah. I mean, the reason why I'm saying that is that the NU 
And then even NCS, when you evaluate the NCS, that's the pure gauge configuration, right? But this Both is not are, a pure gauge, so. It is, but um, uh, the reason why I, I still think is, uh, first of all, NU is really integer value. Yeah. That, that's the, yeah, that's but this the third is zero here. Of, right, but, but that's just a gauge effect, meaning you whether you just dump a winding number to the U versus the CS, it, it's a matter of that question. Yeah, of course. Uh, and, and there's another gauge that uh, you dump every winding number to the NU and you set and it, and it to be zero too. Yeah, of course. And in that picture, NU is again integral integral quantized because because mm -hmm. the U is uh, U is classified by the third homotopy group, and there's no other value you can take except the integer value. Yeah. So so uh, while I think that okay, you can just at least you can numerically study uh, other points which are not integral valued winding number, but I I don't know. I'm just asking in a sense. I feel that um, we should read this plot as, um, how should I say? It? I mean, in other words, I think that the physical stormia, even in the presence of gauge boson and uh, radial Higgs mode uh, should carry um, winding number one. Or, I'm or I mean, actually not there. sure. So for example, Ambir and Rubakov, I don't remember if they find um, their minimum at when the number equals one. But even if, so, for example, if you had all of the winding in, in, in so if you fixed um, N U to be one, I mean, yeah, this transition will look the same, right? It, it doesn't matter which value of N U you have in principle. So it should be displaced, right? Um, so, okay, it maybe it's from a semantics. minus one to zero or something like that. Or maybe, yeah. Oh, so so if I turn off a gauge field completely and only include the Higgs, Higgs field ah, for the moment, then, then it will be exactly like integer value, yes? Yeah, and then it will be an infinite barrier. To... Well, in the presence of a Higgs, still you can have, uh, I guess, find a barrier because it can induce, in principle, instability. No, um, only if uh, only the linearization. Ah, uh, okay. So that's that's. I see. I see. That's yeah. the new. Okay. That's that's what's new. Okay. Yeah. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, I see. So so okay. In in the non-linearly realized one. Just adding radial Higgs does not destabilize the skirmia. Only if you also add a gauge ball, you do do you do the destabilization. I see. Mm. Um, okay, anyways, I guess that, that I can think about. My second question is, you have another plot of um, like showing the uh, interval of in beta uh, when you do have a stability for the uh, Higgs uh, skirmia term. Yes, hey, which... one. No, no, the previous one, yes. So uh, the critical value for the little e was what? What, what was that? Uh, point to nine. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm just trying to see uh, how much the direct theorem gets uh, violated by, by actual numerical evaluation. So anything that above uh, point. So theta theta being point one point five pi is hmm? not that stable. Uh, yeah, well, uh, yeah, it's, yeah. Right. So, so in other words, if we include effect of gauge boson, then you should chop out a further anything above, uh, below, sorry, uh, if e to be point, e is equal to point nine, am I right? Yeah, exactly. So then, so okay, yes. Here indeed, the, the, so the, it, this is the point to, to the left here, basically, so, the skirm term is uh, theta equals uh, 0 0.75, and this is the, it just goes a bit below. Right, so actual skirmy point is then outside of the validity, or is that what you're saying? Or no, the, so the skirm it's, it's inside, it's just by by a, by a very few percent inside the, the range of right, it's very close to the boundary of, of the yeah, yeah, of exactly. The, yes, yeah. I see, yeah. okay. Okay, thanks. 
that was my question. Sorry. Sorry. <clears throat> um, I have a question. So you said that um, even a scalar single, so the, this coefficient is a dimensional, right? Uh, yeah, but okay, yeah, this is in the in the this heft uh, power counting, but in fact, so it's a dimensional, but it should be v over lambda. V over lambda, v over, right? Yeah. That is the way that it's gotten. Yes, yeah. yeah. And lambda is a scale of new physics. Uh, yes. Which okay. here it should be close to four pi v. It should not be too large in the head. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, I, I missed the first part of the, of the talk. Oh, okay. because I, I, so then um, what is the definition again of E? Is a standard definition of the, the skill uh, mechanics? E, yeah, it, here. Okay, very good. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you again. I, I can clap again. Um, that, that was really interesting um, and definitely gave us a lot of things to think about. Um, thank you. Um, thank you again. Uh, unless there are any um, other questions, um, uh, maybe we can uh, uh, adjourn.